Make way for Mr. Speaker. I invite the member for Warner and Monashi to lead the House in prayer order. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, dear Creator, Vaheguru, help us to be the sign of compassion, love, peace, and trust for the people who elected us to be here in this House, to be their voice by putting their trust behind us. When we get busy or carried away, Please renew us, remind us of the blessing of our calling and reawaken our commitment to the people we serve. Let us all learn from one another. You have blessed every human being with a gift for the benefit of the common good. Amen. Introduction by members. Member for Warner and Monashi. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I think there is a confusion. My introduction is at 1.30. My apologies. Thank you. All right. Member for Kootenai East. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. In the virtual gallery today, we have the U15AA East Kootenai Avalanche hockey team uh, that had some success over the weekend. Uh, they went to a cross-provincial tournament in Kelowna, and they won the championship. Uh, the team went undefeated, and the Premier may want to note that the final was won 5-0 over the Victoria Admirals. Uh, congratulations to Dean Kletzel and all the members. It's a truly integrated squad that, ha that has a female goaltender. Uh, would this house please welcome them and congratulate these members from the U15 AA East Kootenai Avalanche. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Private members time. Member for Kootenai East. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Speaking to the statement today of COVID-19, the impacts on government services. The past two years have been challenging to say the least. They have taken a toll on people, on businesses, and on our systems and institutions. The disruptions of the pandemic have certainly extended to government and impacted its regular service to British Columbians. As leaders, it is important for us to be aware of these impacts. And as MLAs, it is our job to relay the concerns of our constituents and the way their lives are being affected by some of these less obvious and less talked about consequences of the pandemic. We know that some of the biggest impacts of COVID-19 have been to our healthcare system. Throughout BC, many of our hospitals are at maximum capacity and our healthcare workers are exhausted and stressed to the limit. Recently, we've seen that even our medical testing companies 
like Life Labs, are dealing with staffing shortages that have led to closures and cancelled appointments. One woman on Vancouver Island was supposed to get a heart monitor removed at her local Life Labs a few weeks ago. But when she arrived for her appointment, it was found that the lab was closed, likely because they lacked the staff to keep it open. This woman was concerned because she was only supposed to have her heart monitor on for 24 hours, and now she found herself with no appointment and no idea to do what next. And Mr. Speaker, this is just one example of someone who was impacted by these closures. Many others reached out to her after she told her story, saying that the same thing happened to them. However, the impacts of COVID-19 extend far beyond our health systems and have repercussions for so many other government services. A service that has been particularly affected by the pandemic is road tests at ICBC. Cancelled appointments in the spring of 2020 led to a significant backlog of more than 50,000 people. And much of that back backlog still exists to this day, meaning extremely long wait times for anyone trying to take a test. This summer, we heard stories of people traveling from Prince Rupert to as far as Salmon Arm in the hopes of getting a test and earning their driver's license in a shorter amount of time. And these long waits aren't just a problem because they're extremely frustrating and inconvenient, but because they can also significantly impact people's lives and their livelihoods. Take one story from, from this summer, for example. A 19-year-old in the shoe shop was forced to quit his job because a lack of available road tests that made it impossible for him to get his license before he moved, meaning that he would be unable to commute to work. He had a good job as a carpenter and used to get a ride to work with a neighbor. But after his family sold their home and moved to another town, he found himself without any transportation options and without the ability to book a road test before November. Quote, it made, difficult, it, made, it made it difficult to get my life in order, end quote. He said when asked about how the delays have impacted him. It's beyond frustrating that a backlog of, a backlog of tests can have such a profound impact on someone's life. We've seen the same thing with commercial driving driver's licensing. We know that the introduction of the mandatory entry level training, or MELT, had a profound impact on tests this year. And yet no effort was made to increase capacity to accommodate for this. As a result, the wait times for class one road tests have skyrocketed and it's having real impacts on drivers' ability to do their job, as well as on their financial well-being. Rosemary Stonehouse lost her job during the pandemic. She had previously been in office work. She got help through our local WorkBC office in Cranbrook to get into a driving school. As WorkBC had mentioned that there was an increasing demand for class one drivers. She worked hard and went through our local driving school and passed the test to get her learners. She then did everything she could to get an appointment. And after calling regularly, she was eventually able to get a full class one test booked for October 14th, 2021. Months, and I mean months after she passed her learner's test. However, when she woke up on October 14th, she realized that she felt quite unwell. She was caught in an impossible situation, as she knew that if she didn't take her test that day, she would miss the deadline for MELT and have to redo her retraining costing her thousands of dollars she didn't have. She made the decision to see if she was well enough to take the test because she had no other options, but she couldn't make it through the front door. She had to miss her test because she was sick and followed strict COVID protocols. But ICBC was unable to make her a makeup appointment in a timely manner as no other appointments were available. Now, after being unemployed for much of the pandemic, Rosemary has to somehow find $16,000 and the time to retake her training under MELT, all because she got sick and followed health orders, something she had no control over. These are the less obvious consequences of the pandemic, things that we don't immediately think of when examining the impact that COVID-19 has had on our lives, but would not have happened otherwise. Government has a responsibility to do its best to mitigate these impacts to ensure that the services it provides to British Columbians continue as smoothly as possible 
and to do the work necessary to look out for the needs of the people of BC. I look forward to the member opposite for his response. Thank you. Thank you, member. <laughs> Recognizing the member for Chilliwack, Kent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has impacted government services. The pandemic has impacted everything, every kind of service. Some of those impacts have been delays, cancellations, limitations on the things we used to enjoy without much thought or planning. Some of those impacts have been innovation and creativity and new accessible modes of delivery. As we have all moved together through this pandemic, we are following the advice of public health officials closely to keep British Columbians as safe as possible and to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. We know that the health and safety of British Columbians is top priority as a province and all public agencies address this pandemic. And although some things look different, it has been inspiring to watch some some dedicated agencies and employees and how they've responded, pivoted, adapted, and how they've been innovative in order to continue offering services while also prioritizing the safety of those we all serve. We've seen government service delivery need to change and pivot in new and sometimes iterative ways. And I want to thank every single person who works in service delivery, planning, policy, and support for the commitment, creativity, and pure resolve it took to find solutions and adapt. For example, I recently visited Service BC in Chilliwack and was blown away by the thoughtful and dedicated commitment demonstrated by every single employee we spoke with. There are 65 Service BC centres and the Provincial Contact Centre and COVID-19 Information Line remain open for business, connecting people in BC to hundreds of government programmes and services. They are also helping people access their BC vaccine card, available by accessing Health Gateway through BC Services app, online, or by calling the vaccination line, or by visiting one of the many Service BC centres located throughout the province. To quickly respond to the scale and urgency of the pandemic, government is working to expand the programs and services that people can access by using their BC Services card and the mobile app. There are currently about 4.85 million BC Service card holders in BC, and between April 2020 and September 2021, more than 1.1 million people verified their Service BC mobile app, giving them faster access to services, programs, and other supports that they count on. Service BC staff are helping to keep BC communities safe through compliance and wellness checks that ensure travelers and temporary foreign workers can maintain their 14-day self-isolation. Service BC teams have made more than 710,000 compliance and wellness calls between April 2020 and September 2021. Service BC also offers help through the COVID-19 information line. The information line was established in March of 2020 to relieve the pressure on 811 by answering non-medical questions about COVID-19 with high quality support in more than 140 languages. Service BC staff have helped people on over 565,000 calls since launching the line. I also note that the member across shared remarks over ICBC delays. It has already been shared, but bears repeating. ICBC recognizes that there is a demand for road testing in all areas of British Columbia. There are multiple reasons for this pressure, some of which were discussed, and the demand for class five and seven road tests has increased significantly compared to previous years. ICBC also continues to manage the demand from the temporary suspension of road testing last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. ICBC has taken many steps to address the demand for testing in BC, including hiring over 80 additional driver examiners. Many driver examiners have also been working overtime in impacted areas as needed. ICBC proactively monitors road test demands and adjusts their resources where needed. Another factor is that driver examiners are not able to complete as many road tests due to COVID-19 related safety protocols. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, this is about safety on so many levels. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'd be remiss if I did not highlight that the best way for us to move through this together is to get vaccinated. Get vaccinated against COVID-19 and join the over 89% of people who have received their first dose and almost 84% of people who are fully vaccinated and do it as soon as possible. Getting through the pandemic has always been a team effort. All of those working so hard to continue delivering services in the face of unprecedented demand and doing it well have demonstrated their commitment to British Columbians and are doing, I think, a remarkable job in supporting people at this difficult moment. Thank you to all those who deliver government services, 
nonprofit services, education and health services, community services, and anyone who gets up, shows up, and works to provide access, service, and support to British Columbians in the safest way possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member. Member for Kootenai East. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for her uh, perspective on this topic and the way that COVID has dramatically impacted every part of our province, even the services uh, that government provides. There have been numerous examples within my constituency alone. I have already talked about the IC testing backlogs, but I cannot stress enough the impact this has had on many individuals, especially those looking to get their Class 1 driver's license. We currently have a shortage of drivers with this certification in BC. And with an ongoing labour shortage, we need to ensure that we are doing our best to support individuals who want to enter this industry rather than making it more difficult for them to do their jobs. Now, the member mentioned apps and things that we can do the, to speed up the process and to reduce the backlogs. However, we need the resources. It's good to have applications and things that get uh, people where they want to be, but we need the resources to follow through and get those people through the queue. However, beyond just the issues of road tests, I also see the impacts on other government services like healthcare firsthand. I mentioned Life Labs earlier, but they are far from the only part of our healthcare system that has been impacted by staffing issues. In fact, we know it's a primary reason for many of the hospital emergency room closures around BC. We've seen it at the Elkford Hospital in my own constituency of Kootenai East. Because of limited staffing availability, this emergency department, a source of vital medical care in the region, is closed until further notice. This means that anyone in Elkford in the need of emergency medical care has to leave their community in order to get the help they need. This results in travel times of up to an hour to the nearest service they can depend on. Mr. Speaker, this is critical for my constituents. Fort St. John Hospital, Saanich Peninsula, here on Vancouver Island, and many others throughout BC have also had to deal with repeated closures because of staffing shortages. These are complicated at times and they're heartbreaking situations that all need the intervention of government to be solved. The pandemic has undoubtedly been hard on this province and made it more difficult than ever to ensure that the services government delivers can be provided to British Columbians in the same way and with the same efficiency they always have. However, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be working hard to solve problems when they appear, doing everything possible to serve the people of this province. I also want to thank all the government service workers across the province as they have worked tirelessly in the most unprecedented situations and that is in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, why government needs to step up. Thank you very much. Thank you, member. Recogni recognizing the member for Nanaimo North Cowichan. Thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the members how many of us have at the dinner table brought up politics, maybe when we ought not have, you know? You, you, you go away swearing, I mean swearing, swearing to not do it again, and never again is what you said the time before, but it happens. You know, we know that Uncle Jake doesn't get along with Cousin Jerry. As long as you stay away from certain subjects, they'll be fine. But sometimes passion makes us uh, turn to subjects that, that do generate heat. And we need to understand that we need to de-escalate and avoid antagonism. Uh, we need to get along in order to have the decent uh, civil dinner that we hope to, and it is true in our communities. This doesn't mean that we agree. We simply sometimes avoid conflict if it doesn't serve us or the interests of our friends and our families. But more than that, we respect our right to take a different view of things. We even expect and accept that these different perspectives represent different experience a different world view. We know that this is the tapestry that is our communities, and we appreciate the critical role that an exchange of ideas plays in our development, both personally and as communities. British Columbians have diverse views across our province, 
And this plays an integral role. It's an essential in ingredient in making our society work. We put our ideas to work in the realm of politics and policy that affects all of us, but not all of us equally. We compete to persuade our neighbours that our ideas offer the solutions people need to answer the challenges of the day. We send our representatives to government at all levels in a reflection of who we are at the moment. Our job here is to represent those ideas and values we find in our communities. We have an obligation to voice the concerns and the passion of our constituents. We are expected to care and to show that in order to represent. It is the necessity of this place that passion be an indispensable part of what we do. And we must reflect that. However, more and more we see people around the world, but also right here in Canada and BC, resorting to intimidation and even violence to express their opinions. That is not acceptable. We can exert our view, compete for support, and even the opportunity to apply our view and values to policy. That is powerful, and it is essentially power we agree to grant to the majority view. While we consent to be governed in the consensus view, we also expect that the minority view will survive, contribute, and be accommodated. In fact, continued support demands it in a pluralistic society. Positive ways people can be involved is to write their representative, to call them, to attend a rally, even a protest, a peaceful protest in an appropriate place, to get involved, to volunteer, to join advocacy groups, these are the ways that we affect the world around us in a civil society. This place may be an odd place to call for peaceful civil discourse, and I may seem an odd messenger. This place is designed to sort out that consensus. The job of representing issues that people care so deeply about can create heat. Things frequently become heated here, and I have played a part in that. I have, particularly in opposition, injected heat into the provincial dialogue. But that is only part of our jobs here. After the, uh, after the opposition, quite rightly, assertively challenged the government's plans, policy and performance in question period. After the theatrics are over, we are colleagues in the hallways. An opposition critic will attack the government's minister, then they'll walk together in the hallway productively and positively working for solutions for the constituents. It is essential to the peace that we make room for each other, for our ideas, to understand the challenges we and our neighbours face. Everyone must feel the security of being able to voice what we care about, free from intimidation. Governance always demands cooperation and compromise to get anything done. And for policies to be sustainable, the views must be accommodated, heard, and considered. It is a competition to be the prevailing view, not to annihilate other points of view. All too often, we see people resorting to intimidation or even violence to silence others, or impose a view by force if necessary. We need to stand together to reject that intolerance and to ensure each of us is free to express our views. Protests outside hospitals and schools that seek to intimidate or interfere with people seeking out essential services for them and their families is unacceptable. Threatening language and actions directed at the very people who we all depend upon to thrive as a community is unacceptable and must remain so in order for us to succeed together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Member for uh, Nanaimo North Couch and for those words. And I think everyone in this place agrees that uh, political intimidation of the public towards politicians is completely unacceptable, and I think he canvassed that well. Uh, what I'd spend my time on is talking about the other political in intimidation that can go the other way. And again, I think we've seen in governments around this world uh, actions by governments uh, that can be made to try to suppress and intimidate the public, industry and organizations from properly engaging uh, respectfully in civil society. 
I would hope that every member in this place would agree that one of the fundamental tenets to make sure there's not political intimidation is to make sure there's a free flowing access to information from government back to the public on issues that they are dealing with. I think every open democracy in this world is known for having free and easy access and in fact those leading democracies are the ones that are actually trying to find ways to make sure access to information is even easier to canvas, not putting in added restrictions, added layers, added things that would actually restrict the public's access uh, to that information. And I would hope all members of this House would actually agree with that sentiment and view that as a form of public intimid uh, uh, political intimidation of the public and of organizations of trying to know exactly what is going on within their government. And we've seen this across the world, Mr. Speaker. I've seen it across the world play out where ministers or, or heads of, of government uh, agencies will write letters back to industry, letters that get uh, perceived and interpreted as very threatening and intimidating coming from a government minister, letters that would uh, threaten to actually pull permits and not reissue permits and be dismissed by governments that those are not actually threatening and those aren't meant to be intimidating. Yet then we see a month or two later, those exact permits disappear and in fact whole industries disappear. And what message does that send, Mr. Speaker, across this world to other industries about that government that they're dealing with? Play ball or else? And I think we can all agree as legislators in this chamber that that's not an acceptable way to govern. And so it's incumbent on all of us to make sure when we talk about political intimidation, we make sure that any government's actions match those words, to make sure that we are not uh, playing a part of advancing political intimidation, but in fact doing exactly as the previous speaker said, opening up the conversation. And the only way to have those free-flowing conversations in a democracy is to have free-flowing information coming back from government, not hidden, not making people jump through hoops to try to access information, but actually freeing up that access to information. Making sure that residents or opposition politicians of any political stripe actually have access. When you look at governments that start to control and suppress information, those are the governments that start to falter around the world. Those are the governments that you start to see massive protests around. Those are the governments that ultimately are not about democracy. They use democracy as a tool to get in but they use political intimidation to try to hang on to power. It inevitably fails to the detriment to the society that they purport to be trying to govern for. And so that's why it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that as legislators, legislators in this place, we do everything we can to make sure that the fear of political intimidation by the public, by political opposition, by industry is not felt. Because when opposition requests information, Mr. Speaker, of any government, opposition is requesting that information on behalf of the public. It's not asking for information strictly for itself. It's asking information because public tasks opposition around the world with going to seek out answers of the government on their behalf. That is what citizens around this world pay opposition parties to do in democracies. They pay them to go to work to hold the government to account, to ask for information, to ask for documents that they don't easily have access to. And they expect that their opposition, at a minimum, would have fair access to those types of information as well. Media certainly plays a large part. And so again, we have to make sure that ministerial actions, ministerial letter writing, ministerial uh, discussion towards industries threatening around permits does not see it play out in action. We all have to safeguard against that, regardless of political strife, regardless of whether you're in opposition or you're in government. That is the role of this place and that is the role of these legislatures around the world that purport to have free democracies, is opening up the doors to government information and shining a bright light on it, not finding ways to prohibit, not finding ways to suppress, not finding ways to invoke political intimidation on a wide range of people trying to simply know what their government is doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Member for Nanaimo North Cowichan. Um, thank you to the member uh, through the speaker. Thank you uh, to the member for that response. Uh, I'm encouraged by this place. I am always encouraged by this place in the end. Uh, I remember hearing once that there's anger and passion in this place so that there isn't blood on the streets. And 
um, it's important that we are able to put to contest these ideas. I appreciate the member actually giving an example of how the opposition is using this um, arena to express a view uh, in criticism of the government, but within the rules and within the bounds of the civil discourse of a parliament. And I appreciate his, his, uh, his contribution. And uh, that is an example of uh, um, a member representing uh, part of our province and seeking to persuade people to his point of view. That is acceptable and that I think is um, commendable. But uh, we do have to stay within the rules. And I think, you know, things do become heated. Um, and people see that in this place. That attracts a lot of attention. Um, but cooperation doesn't attract so much attention. In fact, of somewhere around 70% of votes in this place are unanimously positive. And uh, no one would know that, uh, by the way, the, the discourse of, of politics is presented, generally. Um, and, but I think it's very important, and protest is important. I've participated many times in protest, but within this, the, the bounds of what we accept in our communities, uh, we must send the message from this place that we stand together in opposition to political intimidation and violence of all kinds, including, as the, the uh, previous speaker, the responder, suggested, um, towards the public. We must acknowledge and respect the fact that some people are disproportionately affected by intolerance and intimidation. Uh, as we see elsewhere, indigenous people, people of color and women are disproportionately impacted. Just as this place must protect the expression of views from all corners of our province, we must endeavor in community to ensure all of us feel secure in our right to express our values. We must persuade our neighbours. That's the hard work of democracy, and it's done with hand tools. It's done by writing, it's done by volunteering, it's done by showing up. That's how we make change. It's about convincing people, not coercing them. And it's about balance. And I do appreciate the contribution from the member opposite. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, member. Recognizing the member for Peace River North. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to stand in the House today to speak to one of the important, uh, many important facets of our education system. British Columbia is blessed with one of the highest quality education systems in not only Canada, North America, but indeed around the world. And the success that we British Columbians enjoy would not be possible without the tens of thousands of educators, support staff, administrators, trustees, and of course, ministry staff who help to ensure that our education institutions and the staff have the capacity and resources that they need to care for and continue to educate the hundreds of thousands of children, uh, children across the province every day. But of course, like all education systems, ours is not without challenge, some of which have been increased by, uh, in scope by the pandemic. In an education system that is striving to accommodate more than 600,000 students, it is impossible to create a system that can meet uh, the special learning needs and accommodate for every religious and cultural requirement for every child in British Columbia. This, as many of us know, is where the independent distributed learning, or better known as IDL, plays a crucial role in British Columbia education. IDL supports a, uh, significant, por uh, supports a significant portion of students with special learning needs. And the independent system has two of the largest special needs high schools in the province. Many IDL programs offer a wide range of faith-based and pedagogical uh, perspectives, including Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Islamic, Indigenous, Montessori, and Waldorf systems, just to name a few. Many students who experience bullying in public institutions often find a program to meet their educational needs, as well as a sense of community in our IDL programs and institutions. One of the greatest benefits of IDL is that the enrollment is not confined by the traditional boundaries of schools and school districts. And in rural ridings like mine, where students can find themselves hundreds, possibly even thousands of kilometers away from a school that best meets their learning needs, this flexibility has been invaluable for countless children 
and families across the province. Among many things, COVID has emphasized the need for online learning resources for our students and children, especially those who may reside in households with immunocompromised families or children who are immunocompromised themselves. We cannot understate the value of in-person learning, but we must also recognize that there are many students within this province where in-person learning, in learning presents more challenges than benefits to their education and their social well-being. We are at a time when our province needs to recognize and expand online learning resources to increase the number of students and families who depend on them. With this in mind, you can understand the shock and concern that many families have recently learned that there are some proposed reforms coming to the boundaries for IDL institutions. It's my understanding that starting in 2022-23 school year, public and independent school online authorities can only operate within their districts unless granted special permission by the ministry to cross enroll from another district or authority. This will mean that students not currently residing within school district boundaries, boundaries will no longer be able to attend their chosen schools via online learning. This goes against the wishes of many uh, parents and students who rely on the programs and resources offered by IDL schools, which cater to their very specific learning needs. If a special agreement isn't granted to the IDL schools, the impact on students will be significant. The proposed changes could sig uh, significantly limit the scope of IDL institutions available to them, the students, and the families who rely on them. Furthermore, BC families feel that there has not been appropriate level of notification, nor the opportunity for public engagement, and the consultation has not been engaged. Many of these cha uh, changes have blindsided students and families, as have been made apparent by the overwhelming number of letters that I've received in my constituency office. I know others on this side have received many letters, and I'm sure all members of this House have received as well. Honourable Speaker, as a former school teacher myself, I'm a firm believer that a good education is the greatest gift that we can bestow upon a child. It's the greatest investment that we, as a province, can make in our collective future. The changes made to our education system should always be in the spirit of adding options and flexibility to encompass more students and families and to show them that they will always have access to learning that meets their very specific needs. When hundreds and even thousands of families are raising their voice in public outcry because they believe that the proposed changes will do the exact opposite and in fact run the risk of pushing their children through the cracks, it is a signal that the government must take a step back and rethink its approach. I implore government to heed the calls of BC families and educators. There is still time for appropriate public consultation before these new measures come into place. And there is time for us to change direction, to allow the students to look forward to a brighter future, both through the current challenges and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the member, I believe, uh, for Victoria Beacon Hill. Yes, Victoria Beacon Hill. Thank you, Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to rise today to speak to the statement by the member for Peace River North. Like many areas of our life, from employment and how we do our jobs to social connections and the way we engage in the economy, how kids go to school and learn was deeply affected, particularly by the first year of the pandemic. In 2020, this meant shifting the majority of learning to remote learning, while keeping schools open for children of frontline workers and students needing the additional supports in the classroom. In 2021, while BC was one of a few provinces to keep schools open all year, youth in secondary school saw changes to their schedules, hours of education and more. And like many aspects of our lives, some of the changes and pivots revealed as many opportunities for positive change as challenges. There are kids and youth who thrown into a new way of learning found that the shift actually worked for them and was a fit for their learning needs. And as my colleague notes, this form of learning is not necessary just in a pandemic, 
nor for students seeking alternatives of, uh, alternative ways rather of rising to their full potential. Rural and remote students and families also benefit from and in some cases need access to virtual learning opportunities. That is why it has never been more important, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that equity and quality are the cornerstones of online learning in BC. Indeed, next year, students and families will see modernization and improvements to the distributed learning model, now more clearly and appropriately called online learning. While these changes to online delivery have their origins in a 2018-2019 review and online learning working group, the benefit of modernization and the possibilities it opens up for students was made clear over the last year and a half. Modernization aimed at flexibility for students to help meet their personal learning needs, from generalized to specialized programs, from full online enrollment to blended learning opportunities. Whether that's logging on into specialized courses like languages or connecting to classes that meet their, meet their unique learning needs. Flexibility and equal access, including access to and connections with educators. It's about equity and excellence, Mr. Speaker. Of course, these changes must work for families, parents, and students. And I know our government and Minister Whiteside are committed to this, consulting with advocate groups such as Autism BC and BC Ed Access in order to hear directly from the people who know students with the, who know students' diverse learning needs best. And the Ministry of Education staff are working with the BC Confederation of Parent Advisory Councils, Federation of Independent Schools, Métis Nation BC, and the First Nation Education Steering Committee to hear updates, to share updates and listen to feedback. A focus on quality and equity, ensuring that all students in both public and independent online schools are well supported in their programs, that teachers have the, the tools and resources they need, and that fragmentation is reduced. This means sharing best practices and supporting educators. It means quality assurances. Teachers able to access and share high quality online learning resources and courses through online platforms. Supporting teachers and supporting students. This is our government's commitment for both online learning and traditional brick and mortar schools. And Mr. Speaker, public education is a public good. We've made record investments in our public education system, more funding for students with learning needs, more funding for Indigenous learners, and more funding for mental health supports in schools. And who benefits from public education? We all do. Neighborhoods and communities and employers and businesses and the public sector from one end of the province to the other. Public education and the access uh, to the excellent, excellence it provides is a question of equity and ensuring that everyone in our province is equipped to learn, make connections, build skills, and create the life they want in our province. I'm proud to speak in response to this statement, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Peace River North for raising it and allowing us to discuss it. I know it matters to students, teachers, parents, and families. Thank you. Thank you, member. Member for Peace River North. Uh, thanks, Honourable Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for Victoria Beacon Hill for her, her comments. Uh, I want to use my closing comments to reflect on the current situation in our province's education system and the context in which we need to consider the changes that we push for that will have a lasting impact uh, on our children's immediate future as well as the long-term future. And Honourable Speaker, it goes without saying, uh, undoubtedly things have changed uh, as we view and carry out many aspects of our life. Uh, due to COVID-19 now and as we move forward. And the member for Victoria Beacon Hill also commented about many of these changes that we've seen over the past year, which uh, many have been good and will last probably for many years uh, to come as we move forward. COVID has made us reevaluate how we live, how we work, and how we learn. Our online and virtual resources are now invaluable tools in our daily lives, and I would argue even more so for our children. And it's pretty obvious um, when, when I even try and help my own kids, it's very obvious how frustrated they get with me uh, when I'm trying to utilize Google this or chat that or all these other tools now that uh, are, are part of kids' regular education regimes. We cannot underestimate the importance, though, uh, to the value of in-class learning for our children's own growth and development, but we do also need to recognize that our education system needs a space for online learning resources. And I often think we have taken a step in the wrong direction uh, as this province in recent years 
um, has, has moved us to a point of where we're going. I remember when I was serving as the opposition education critic, um, I was receiving similar uh, emails and, and uh, uh, correspondence from parents and families that were in IDL who were concerned about uh, some cuts to programs that were received in the midst of the first wave of the pandemic at a time when online learning resources and online learning was so important. Uh, my friend and colleague, the member for Fraser Nicola, who has taken on the critics since then, has done a great job advocating for students, uh, parents and educators across the province. But we're back here again, it seems, um, doing this again. As you can see, Honourable Speaker, this is why it doesn't feel like we are taking steps forward. It seems a bit stagnant. Our online tools and resources are invaluable to our children's education. They keep our children safe, our families informed, and ensure transparency in our school systems. And they help forward and advance our children's learning, which is really what this is all about. So I hope we can move forward by enacting policies and changes that will give our children and families the many tools that they will need to be successful now and in tomorrow. And I really appreciate the Minister of Education sitting here today listening to this, uh, uh, to this statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the Member for North Vancouver, Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to address the members of this House on a topic that is important to many of us, not the least of whom is myself. I do, not want, I do want to acknowledge at this time that I'm working and staying as a guest on the unceded lands of the Songhees, Esquimalt and Lekongon speaking people, and that the riding I represent, live and work in is in the territory of the Coast Salish, specifically the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. The information I will start by reviewing is extracted from the Canadian Public Health Association website. If anyone wants a more comprehensive overview, I can refer them to there. This is a brief history of immunization in Canada, which has a great deal to offer our current state. Prior to 1910, smallpox, rubella, tetanus, and pertussis were all identified. However, the only vaccine that was available at that time was for smallpox. Between 1910 and 1939, a vaccine for pertussis became available. There was a Spanish flu pandemic, and diphtheria was a common cause of death for children one, ages one to five, and a diphtheria vaccine was developed. Deaths from tetanus continued, and a mumps virus was isolated. Between 1940 and 1959, anti-tetanus shots were introduced, and routine pertussis immunization was started. The Salk uh, polio vaccine in 1955 reduced the incidence of polio cases from 9,000 a year in 1953 to three cases a year in 1965. At that time, the measles vi virus was isolated. In the 1960s, an oral polio vaccine was licensed for use in Canada. The rubella virus was isolated. And there were 300,000 to 400,000 cases of measles annually prior to a measles vaccine being approved. NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, was formed and no wild polio cases were reported by 1968. The rubella vaccine reduced the incidence of rubella by 60,000 cases a year. The 1970s were a relatively uneventful decade related to vaccinations, and as, uh, but the routine smallpox vaccinations were stopped with the last Indigenous case of smallpox being reported in Somalia. In the 1980s, smallpox was certified to be eradicated, which was endorsed by the World Health Organization. The hepatitis B vaccine became available in Canada with school-based programs beginning in 1987. Before widespread immunization, there were about 3,000 cases of hep B per year. By 2004, there were 829. The MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella, immunization program was introduced for all infants. Rubella cases went from approximately 5,300 per year to fewer than 30 cases per year. Also, the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine is approved for use in Vancouver. You can look that one up yourselves. In, in the 1990s, 
the introduction of the Hib or Haemophilus influenza vaccine in Canada. Over 400 children with Hib infections were admitted to hospital annually. Four years after the introduction of the vaccine, eight cases per year. Canada is certified as polio free during this time, and the two dose MMR immunization is introduced. Pertussis, which is whooping cough, outbreaks continue to occur in some communities with low vaccination rates. And the varicella, or chickenpox vaccine, becomes available in Canada. In the 2000s, a meningococcal vaccine is approved for use in Canada and made available to all provinces as part of the routine infant immunizations as of 2005 to prevent the onset of meningitis in children and youth. The inactivated influenza vaccine is recommended for all children 6 to 23 months of, year, of age. In 2006, the per first HPV, which is human papillovirus, vaccine is approved for use in Canada to reduce the risk that young and adult women will develop cervical cancer. This is promoted throughout the world by, among others, the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. A live oral gastroenteritis vaccine is approved for the use of infants 6 to 32 weeks of age in Canada. And the herpes zoster, or shingles vaccine, is, is approved for use in Canada. Remember, Mr. Speaker, that a lot of this work was done prior to the availability of communications and communication tools and com computers that allowed collaboration. Smallpox, rubella, tetanus and pertussis, diphtheria, polio, hepatitis, hem haemophilus influenza, pertussis, shingles, meningitis, influenza, human papilloma vi virus. All of these were recognized as significant threats to the health of various populations, researched extensively, vaccines were developed, vetted intensely, and introduced through the public health system to reduce and in some instances eradicate diseases that could cripple or kill children and adults. However, the scientists and public health systems could not do this alone. The people that were at risk of being affected are the ones that made all of these steps work. Initially, the only thing that people knew was if you got sick, you rarely survived. You would have to have no income, you would not be able to run your farm or business, and any dependents that you have were also in severe jeopardy of catching the disease or dying of starvation. Today, I wish history would repeat itself. We have had a pandemic, the disease is here. We have a vaccination, the solution is here. All we need now is for the at-risk population to do the rest for themselves for their families, for their communities, province, country, and in fact, the world. And guess what? We are all the at-risk population. Additionally, this is the first time that the world has seen a high level of international scientific collaboration. This is a different type of war, one that has many casualties throughout the world, and we have the option of stopping it. It is not up to the generals or the admirals. It is up to us to decide on an individual and collective basis that we can reduce and perhaps in time eradicate COVID and certainly get to a point where it is in, as innocuous as the flu if contracted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the Member for Surrey South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Member for North Vancouver Seymour for the history. With over 100 million people infected and over 2 million deaths, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the lives of almost everyone on Earth. It's scary stuff, and after more than a year and a half of lockdowns and restrictions and daily updates, we all want to get back to normal. Unfortunately, though, at the same time, there's also public skepticism and hostility to the most promising solution to control the pandemic, the vaccine. It's tempting to dismiss those who refuse the vaccine as conspiracy theorists, but we cannot. Conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers are not the only groups who are hesitant. It isn't confined by ethnicity or religion or profession. We know that healthcare workers, we have healthcare workers who aren't vaccinated and I doubt that most of us would uh, call them names. They're the same people we've been saluting for their tireless efforts to help others. The reality is more likely that hesitancy is a lack of trust in authorities, in the federal government, in the provincial government, in politicians like us. And more probably, uh, and probably more needs to be done to understand and address why those people are hesitant. 
but right now we don't have the luxury of time. Vaccines are supported by decades of medical research. They work in pre by preparing the body's own immune system to recognize and defend against a specific disease. Now it's normal to have questions about vaccines, just like it is any drug or medical procedure. So if someone you know expresses concern about vaccines, listen to them with empathy. Don't dismiss them. Ask questions to better understand their concerns and offer to share information from trusted sources. Share your own reasons for wanting to get vaccinated. In the early 1900s, polio was a worldwide disease paralyzing hundreds of thousands of people every year. By 1950, two effective vaccines against the disease had been developed. Through the 80s, a united worldwide effort to eradicate polio from the planet began. And in August 2020, the African continent was certified wild polio virus free, leaving only a few countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, where polio has yet to be eradicated. My friend Gail wasn't vaccinated against polio. She contracted the disease as a child, and it left her with significant disabilities that she's had to manage throughout her life. She was quick to get the COVID vaccine, and she wants others to know how important it is. Vaccines have saved more lives in Canada than any other medical intervention in the past 50 years. Before we had vaccines, many Canadians died from diseases we can now prevent. Vaccines prevent against diseases that are not necessarily deadly, but can cause pain and long-term health problems as well. These diseases are only a plane ride away. Without protection from vaccines, these diseases spread quickly and outbreaks can occur. In 2014, you might remember in the Fraser Valley, uh, we experienced the largest measles outbreak in BC in 30 years. It was thought to be caused by a traveler from another country where another outbreak was occurring. Low immunization rates in one community allowed measles to spread quickly, resulting in over 400 cases. That's 400 people who didn't have to get sick. So today we're talking about COVID, and it is the most pressing issue. But the same reasoning applies to other vaccines that we have had for years, and ones that will be developed in the future. When we have the ability, we ha when we have a vaccine, we need to use it. We need to use it to protect ourselves and other members of our community who might not be able to. Like babies who are too young to be vaccinated. Like people who can't receive a certain vaccine for medical reasons. Like people who may not adequately respond to immunization, such as elders with poor immune systems, or frankly, people like me. So if you are able, please, Get vaccinated. This is our chance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you so much for the supportive remarks for the, from the member from Surrey South. The challenge is that if various communities do not achieve a target vaccination rate, it puts those people and others at risk. People who are vaccinated can still contract COVID with milder symptoms or transmit it while manifesting no symptoms at all. People who are not vaccinated have a substantially greater possibility of having severe enough symptoms that they have to be managed in hospital, perhaps in ICU. And if they survive, they may have lingering effects that impact their cardiac and respiratory functions for a prolonged period, if not permanently. Is this a risk we are willing to take for ourselves and our families? I believe everyone is looking forward to the end of COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictions that we must follow to contain it. My gratitude is boundless to all the many types of workers, frontline health, emergency personnel, others who have kept our economy going, food on our tables, and some semblance of safe social interaction happening. And to all those who have gotten the vaccine, you have strengthened the safety net that we all depend on to get beyond this pandemic. I've had the opportunity to speak with clients who are permanently dependent on mechanical ventilation, also a result of childhood polio. I've also met one of my uh, constituents' moms who is dealing with post-polio system that has post-polio syndrome that has had a profound effect on the latter parts of her life. She's always been energetic and active, and now she's not able to be either of those things. When she was 10, she developed the polio, 
the vaccine came afterwards. And the conversations around the vaccine were very similar to what we were doing now. She really wishes she had had access to the vaccine. As a health care provider, I've gotten the flu, I have gotten the flu vaccine annually to ensure that not only I have a re reduced risk of getting the flu, but also that I have a much reduced risk of transmitting it to the very vulnerable people I serve. I've also vaccinated 501 people since February in a variety of settings. Mr. Speaker, I believe we all want to get to a place where we can see each other without masks, to hug, to dance, or sing in close proximity. We all want to stop drenching our hands in sanitizer. In short, we all want the COVID pandemic to go away. We want to once again feel that our elders and our children are safe and get beyond the restrictions currently needed. The key to getting to this place of safety with each other has been offered to and accepted by over 85% of BC's population through immunization. Once again, our public health system has risen to the challenge and is providing an effective proactive measure to manage the transmission, spread and severity of a virulent and often deadly disease that has impacted all of us. Immunization is available to ev everybody at no cost. I encourage us all to get vaxxed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Thank you very much for the statements today. Um, I believe we're going to go to the Government House Leader before we come to the member who's eagerly waiting his place. Uh, Acting Government House Leader. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I ask that the House consider proceeding with motion number 17, standing in the name of the member for Caribou Chilcotin. Members, unanimous consent of the House is required to proceed to motion 17 without disturbing the priorities of the motions preceding it on the order paper. If any member is opposed to the request for leave, please indicate now. Leave has been granted. I recognize the member for Caribou Chilcotin to move the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, I move the following motion. Be it resolved that this House recognize the lessons learned from this year's historic wildfire season and implement them to better prepare our response to the future wildfires and needed post-wildfire recovery. Mr. Speaker, it's certainly not been an easy year for so many of us here in British Columbia, particularly those in the interior. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic continues to take a toll, and many people are still dealing with the impacts of this summer's devastating wildfire season. This year was the third worst wildfires in our province, with thousands of hectares of forest and rangeland destroyed and nearly 33,000 people displaced. Very few communities in the region emerged unscathed, whether they had to evacuate, face the loss of structures, destruction of land, or had to put up with smoky skies for far too many days. Like much of British Columbia, my constituency is dependent on the government to address the aftermath of the fires but we have yet to see much in terms of meaningful action. Many suppliers of hay and temporary grazing areas, along with truckers, have not been paid for their services due to slow payable systems that have seen these individuals and small businesses having to finance the recovery effort on their own. Our agricultural and resource sectors were particularly hard hit, putting many people's livelihoods at risk. For some ranchers, the fires meant the loss of livestock and destruction of important productive land, leading to feed shortages. Farmers are short hundreds of bales of hay needed to feed their animals this winter and left with the land that may likely not be able to produce anything for a year or more. Other ranchers, like the Cunningham family in the South Caribou, are eager to get their cattle back to the range, Mr. Speaker, but they can't do that until the crown fencing is replaced, which requires disaster financial assistance. This funding from the federal government must be secured by the province, but the NDP have still not made progress on this. In the hopes of prompting efficient action, I asked the Minister of Agriculture about this funding directly in question period a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, she did not have much to offer my constituents in way of reassurance. She told me that the discussions about securing this funding are, quote, conversations that will continue, end quote. But, Mr. Speaker, that's simply not good enough. It's not good enough for the Cunninghams, and it's certainly not good enough for the dozens of other ranchers who are impacted by this problem. 
British Columbians whose livelihoods hang in the balance need to know that this government is doing far more than just having conversations. They need real action, support and relief. Last week, I wrote to the Minister of Public Safety asking again about securing this desperately needed funding and still don't have a clear answer on when this situation will be resolved. People are waiting. They're dependent on the government for recovery, but once again left without the help they need. And it's not just my constituents that need support, Mr. Speaker. It's thousands of people throughout this province. And I'm sure we'll hear from their MLAs this morning about specific issues that are impacting them and their communities. But beyond recovery support, we also need action from the government developing new strategies to prevent and fight wildfires. I've spoken on this to some extent before, but it's absolutely essential that we learn from the past lessons and implement tactics based on those lessons. It's not enough, Mr. Speaker, anymore to just write reports about what knowledge we've gained and then leave them on the shelf. We absolutely must implement them on the ground. Additionally, we need to improve transparency around wildfires. Not knowing what government is doing only adds stress to those of us on the ground. Freedom of Information Act requests from the opposition for information on how wildfire resources were allocated this year were returned with a single line stating that no records were found on this topic. This is alarming to say the least. I think it's clear that it's a time to modernize the way we approach fighting and recovering from wildfires. We need to better utilize local and Indigenous knowledge, use all of the resources at our disposal and take further steps to tackle climate change so that the destruction we have seen this year does not become the norm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member. Surrey Cloverdale, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from the Caribou Chilcotin. Um, I think we both agree that this is, a, this is a subject that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, but no one denies that the wildfires were devastating this year. Fire converging at categories rank five is extreme, and rank six is something that has not been seen before. I acknowledge that it's devastating to lose your belongings, home, and other items to wildfire. It was a tragedy that there was two lives lost in Lytton. But what we saw, Mr. Speaker, in this one was the people that disobeyed evacuation orders that compounded fighting these fires. We as a House must stand together to uphold the laws that keep people safe. But to embolden the actions of those who may have defied evacuation orders is wrong. And last week, the, the member from Kamloops, uh, South Thompson, stated, it's easy to judge these folks, but it takes more of an effort to stop and listen to what might prompt someone to stay behind and risk their lives during an emergency. Mr. Speaker, when somebody who's untrained and decides to risk their own life during an emergency, it only delays the crews getting engaged with these wildfires. We saw the news footage of the person who decided to get a portable pump, fire hose, and a nozzle to protect their property. And then a few days later, we saw the news footage of a melted plastic hose and the fire hose that was burnt. We also saw footage of a fireboat that was going to deliver water along areas of a beach with a fire pump only to stop and have to rescue people that did not leave when the evacuation orders were given. Mr. Speaker, the motion is a good motion. Debriefs of possible lessons learned happen every year by all agencies at the end of wildfire seasons. When I was in Barrier in 2003, I can tell you that I have the most respect and, uh, for the women and men who were doing their best to protect the various communities that were there. When I was there, I said I'd never do their job on a full-time basis. I said I'd rather be in a three-story apartment fire with a half a tank of air on my back. The feelings were mutual, as none of the wildland firefighters ever wanted to do my job. Having structural firefighters working next to wildland fighters was a necessity at that time, and it remains that way this year. So what happened with changes and reviews of previous seasons? Fire smart programs are proof that reviews and lessons learned work. Our government's investing in $60 million to support local governments and First Nations becoming fire smart. 365 grants have been issued to date supporting communities like Logan Lake, Canada's first fire smart community. And we all know how well fire smart worked in Logan Lake. 
Fuel management is a big part of what came out of the reviews in the previous seasons. And I'd like to pause and thank those who took care of those people that were evacuated. Many of those who worked in the ESSs were volunteers and worked tirelessly for days. Those who worked in the EOCs said so long to their family for weeks at a time. Let's not forget those people working in the EOCs coordinate the efforts of BC Wildfire Fire Service and the subject matter experts who are using their knowledge, skills and abilities to best fight these fires. When the province was experiencing significant fire activity, the BC Wildfire Service called upon other agencies for additional resources such as equipment, personnel and aircraft. The BC Wildfire Service has arrangements with dozens of companies from many areas of the province to provide contract firefighters and support personnel. And many times, Mr. Speaker, these contractors are locally sourced. If its own personnel are stretched to capacity, BC Wildfire Service can call upon other resources from other contract crews, fire suppression specialists, or from its national and international partners. However, this summer, these subject matters experts were put into scenarios never seen before. We had the driest summer on record. A heat dome and heat waves made the working conditions for those firefighters difficult at best. My time in Barrier reminded me of how lucky I was to work the night shift from 6 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning. To add to the dry forest and high temperatures was the unpredictability of high winds. Even Mark Madriga couldn't get that one right. You can backburn, you can create fire guards, but when unpredictable weather changes, you don't have a chance. Mr. Speaker, in closing, with regards to evacuation orders and leaving your possessions behind, I think it was best said by Chief Byron Lewis of the Okanagan Indian Band, and he said it best when he said, and then you come to the realization the most valuable possession you have in your house is that of your family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Thank you, member. Members, before we go on to the next speaker, I, during the last uh, speech, I was a little concerned, so I just want to go back to unparliamentary language. Standing Order 42 prohibits offensive words against another member. Um, the main transgressions of unparliamentary language are imputation of false motives. Members cannot quote another member's words to avoid offending Standing Order 40. A member cannot do indirectly what a member is unable to do directly. If the conduct of a member cannot be canvassed in debate, nor can changes of a personal character be made, except by substantive motion, for which notice is required. So uh, I'm not saying somebody crossed the line. I'm just very sensitive to the words calling into question the motives of another member of this House, and just want to uh, advise members to be very careful. Thank you. Natako Lakes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I uh, want to thank the member from uh, Kerbridge Colton for bringing forward this motion. Um, you know, lessons learned in terms of fires. If you have an, uh, if you, if you grow up in a rural area and you live out in a rural area, you put your heart and soul into the land, into the area around you, to your family, to your community, and when it's, when it's threatened by fire. You hope that government will be able to be there to be able to help fight and help protect your land. And it's, it's a tragic that in the past, we've seen examples where that didn't happen. And now I want to start by saying to the, to the firefighters, the people in the front line, I have nothing but admiration and thank you and thanks for the people who fight fires. It's remarkable how dedicated and how hardworking they are I know I fought fires with them. I know what it's like to be out on the lines and doing that work. It is tough. It is difficult work. But when the member from Surrey Cloverdale came up and, and made an accusation about the people that stayed behind in communities to fight and, and to save their homes, I take great offense to that. And I'll explain why. In 2018, across Fran Francois Lake, there was an entire community there the South Bank, South Bank, that entire area, that has about 15% of the population that lives in my riding, that live in that area. They were put under siege. They decided, you know, people, some people left, lots of people started to stay behind and fight. Why? Because they're remote, they support one another, they get in there, 
and, and do the work on the ground. And they fought side by side with firefighters and, and others that came in. But they were under siege. They were not allowed to cross the lake to get supplies. They were not allowed to have fuel come in. It wasn't allowed for them to be able to have pumps and hoses to come in to help fight these fires. We had to sneak that stuff in against the government blockade. And it makes me furious when I hear the member from Surrey Cloverdale stand up and make accusations against people that want to stay behind and fight for their family and fight for their home and fight for their livelihoods. Multiple generations put efforts and work into that. And all they're asking for is a little help. That's all they ask for. They want to be in there to help fight. They want to be in there to protect what they have. And unless you live in that circumstance, unless you see that, you don't understand that passion. And to make an accusation and to not learn the lessons of what happened on the ground is just shameful. It is shameful. I spoke after the 2018 fires with the, with the head of BC Wildfire Service, who is now the uh, deputy for, for the Ministry of Forests. I spoke with them about what some other jurisdictions do, how they can sign waivers so that there isn't liability issues, so that when they can bring in support, if something goes wrong, government will be held accountable. But people need to be able to make choices on the ground. And I encourage people to leave those kind of dangerous situations. But when people make the decision to stay, they shouldn't be kept under siege. They shouldn't be tried to starve out, to force them out. They've made a decision to protect their lands. Work with them. Figure out how you can support them. Yes, get rid of the liability issue, sign a waiver, whatever the case may be. There were RCMP officers that went door to door to try and encourage people to leave. And when people decided not to leave, they asked for their dental records so that they could be identified in case there was a tragedy. How do they think that makes people feel? But Mr. Speaker, there's a lot more that needs to be learned from fires. There are so many examples of private sector crews that went in to fight fires, that went in to start when a fire was just at the small stages and were told to stand down by the BC Wildfire Service uh, folks that came out because they hadn't had done an assessment yet. Those people could have had the fires out. And I'll give you one quick example of uh, back in 2018, Interfor had crews that were trained, that were ready to go a fire up in the area. They were told they couldn't go in the next day. They said, when are you going to come and do the assessment? Well, we're busy, but you know, you can't go in yet. The next day after that, they called and said, look, we're going to get in there and get this fire out. And they were told, if you go in there, we'll sue you. We'll go after you legally. You can't go in there until we do the assessment. After day five, the winds picked up, the fire took off, and a thousand hectare fires started from that. Things have to change. Government needs to learn lessons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Recognizing North Coast. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. This past summer saw one of the worst wildfire seasons in this province's history, burning over 860,000 hectares and displacing more than 32,000 people. Over 500 structures, including many people's homes, were lost, and tragically, two lives were lost. At the height of the summer, over 3,000 personnel were helping to fight fires, including personnel from Mexico, Australia, and across Canada. This past season put firefighting crews, emergency responders, and communities to the test, particularly as we also deal with a global pandemic. In recent years, the BC government has invested heavily in wildfire prevention and preparedness initiatives to help keep British Columbians safe and to protect the province's natural resources and infrastructure. It's difficult to forecast wildfire suppression costs for any given year, since each wildfire season varies significantly depending on weather conditions and the number and severity of wildfires. The BC government has allocated $136 million for direct fire costs in Budget 2021 for the 21-22 wildfire season. These significant increases recognize historical firefighting costs and allow for more response capacity, community engagement and communication resources to help communities be better prepared for wildfires. But we will, also, we will always spend what is necessary to protect people and property. 
We know that climate change is expected to make these types of extreme events more frequent and that we need strong, coordinated action around the world to reduce emissions and build a cleaner economy for everyone. In BC, we're taking a range of actions through our Clean BC plan to build a more sustainable future powered by more renewable energy. BC's draft climate preparedness and adaptation strategy helps to ensure we stay safe and respond effectively in a changing climate. It builds on the 2019 Preliminary Strategic Climate Risk Assessment, which examines some of the greatest risk to BC as a result of climate change. BC's climate preparedness and adaptation strategy builds on over a decade of work by leaders within government and across communities. Here are some of the programs and initiatives BC already has in place to help prepare for the impacts of wildfires due to climate change. The Community Resiliency Investment Program, which provides $60 million to assist Indigenous communities and local governments to reduce local wildfire threats through FireSmart and Crown Land Wildfire Risk Reduction. Over 365 grants have been issued to date, supporting communities like Logan Lake, Canada's first FireSmart community. Whether it's increasing emergency planning capacity, managing vegetation, or taking critical steps to protect community, infrastructure, and homes, we need to actively mitigate wildfire risks. We'll also be undertaking more prescribed burns, carrying out fuel mitigation work, and supporting more communities in becoming fire smart. We're committed to ensuring we're better prepared for future fire seasons, and that critical work is happening right now. We have BC's Cultural and Prescribed Fire Initiative, which promotes healthy forests and reduces wildfire risk. The province is investing in wildfire risk reduction, reforestation, forest rehabilitation, and other efforts through the Forest Enhancement Society of BC. Through Stronger BC, the province is investing in projects that will reduce the risk of wildfires on Crown land while creating more than 500 jobs in rural communities. BC is improving predictive services models to improve wildfire preparedness and response activities. The BC Fire Smart Begins at Home Manual provides practical advice for individual British Columbians to reduce wildfire risk around their homes and properties. A farm and ranch wildfire guide, workbook and instructional videos have been developed to help farmers and ranchers to prepare for future wildfires. Honourable Speakers, these are some of the actions we're taking to adapt to wildfires due to a changing climate. There's always more work to do and more lessons to be learned, and we're committed to helping British Columbians build resiliency and to be better prepared. We know that investing now in the future not only makes wise financial sense, but it improves the outcomes for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Member for Shushwap, please. Well, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I'm honoured to stand and speak to this motion. Uh, the wildfire season is among the most devastating in our recent history. 1,610 wildfires displaced more than 33,000 people, according to Emergency Management BC. That's nearly five and a half times the number of people that were forced from their homes in 2018, and twice as many compared to 2017. My own riding of Shushwap endured Many of the hardships and anxieties that many communities faced as some of BC's most destructive fires threatened our region, including the Two Mile Road Fire, the Bunting Road Fire, the Hanakwa Fire, Crazy Creek Gorge Fire, and the White Rock Lake Fire. My own residency in, in Sycamus, um, my family was actually on evacuation alert for a two week period, and fortunately, uh, largely due to the amazing hard work and dedication of the BC Wildfire Service, uh, that fire did not actually come into the community and there was no structures lost. Unfortunately and sadly, uh, the White Rock Lake Fire, uh, which uh, had a significant and devastating impact uh, on the west side road uh, along Okanagan Lake, the Okanagan Lake Indian Band, uh, had some devastating losses. Uh, their grocery store, hardware store, was actually uh, decimated by the fire. There was over 500 band members that were actually out of their homes for over a 30-day period. And along West Side Road, uh, there was actually 2,500 residents that were actually evacuated from ho their homes for an entire 30-day period. Many of the businesses in that area had devastating losses uh, because the West Side Road was actually shut down uh, for over a month-long period. So the impacts of the structural losses is, is one component, 
uh, but the business losses are also extremely significant. Uh, there's a, if anybody has driven on highway number one, uh, heading east towards um, uh, Calgary, uh, the Three Valley Chateau. It's a, an amazing resort development right on the side of the Trans-Canada Highway. Uh, there was a fire that erupted there back in July and uh, their business was shut down for a full 30 days. For 30 days, uh, they lost their receipts. Now, this is a seasonal business. It only operates basically from May until October. Uh, but losing that one month of the season, as well as all the negative publicity around uh, the uh, Three Valley Fire, uh, just absolutely devastated uh, their ability. And it wasn't just the business itself, but obviously all of those local residents that actually worked in that facility. So the significant impacts of these fires have far-reaching implications you know, not just on the fires and the actual structural losses themselves, but also the impact on the negative business activity. The Crazy Creek Fire, uh, and this is one area that I hope BC Wildfire Service will pay more attention to in the future. Uh, there's a Crazy Creek Hot Springs, there's a small uh, resort development, two different businesses there. Because the name of the fire att was attached as a Crazy Creek Fire, even though the fire was nowhere in proximity to these facilities, all of the media attention indicated that uh, it was a Crazy Creek fire and they had cancellation after cancellation after cancellation. And they were put in a place where they were having to try and defend the fact that the fire was actually on another ridge many, many miles away, not actually even impacting their facilities. And yet they also had financial hardships and losses associated with that. The other piece, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I think is, is worthy of, of conversation is the impact on people's mental health. We all know the impacts of COVID, having to self-isolate or even quarantine in your housing. And we finally got to the point where I think British Columbians were feeling safe to go out with the vaccinations. And uh, if I can speak uh, from a personal nature, uh, my stepfather has COPD. And <clears throat> he got to the point where finally he was double vaccinated, felt safe to get out in the community. And then we had the wildfires. And we were actually choking on the smoke. Uh, the air quality was 17 times worse than the recommended um, uh, level by World Health Ar Organization. And so my stepfather, again, because of all the smoke, was again self-isolating inside his home for about a 45-day period. Uh, so there's many, many impacts of these fires. And uh, just in closing, uh, Honourable Speaker, I think it's also worth... Uh, talking about what's happened with BC Wildfire Service. They seem to be moving away from putting fires out and more from trying to manage them. And I certainly appreciate it's a very daunting endeavor. But, uh, you know, when we have a look at the impacts on climate change, uh, I see, saw some stats here this morning indicated that the 2018 wildfire se season, 237.4 uh, megatons of emissions uh, emitted from forest management in BC. And the total emissions from all man-made causes, only 68 megatons. 78% of the emissions of British Thank Columbia you. are not reported Thank under you current member. climate action. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Boundary Similkameen, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It may be a cliched term, but the line, build back better, still resonates very well with me, and I rise to speak in favour of this motion because I believe that the heart of the motion is about just that, taking the experiences of yesterday and learning how to rebuild our policy, rebuild our communities to be better than they were before. One tangible legislative outcome of that same perspective is the wholesale modernization of the Emergency Program Act that we have on the horizon. While the 2021 wildfires didn't burn as many hectares as the 2017 and 2018 fires, the 1,590 fires that burnt this summer did impact more structures, created more evacuation orders and more alerts than either of those other recent fire seasons. And at over $600 million invested to help keep people and forests safe, the costs of this year's fire season are significant. Firefighting is tough work at the best of times, and given the context of this year's fires within COVID pandemic, the challenge at hand was even more significant. So I want to start by expressing some gratitude to the thousands of people that leaned in to help with this challenge and help keep us safe. This includes the ground crews and air support, the logistics teams and the finance folks, the industry crews and volunteers. The list could go on and on. At its peak, we had over 3,500 people on the ground 
to keep our forests safe and to keep our communities safe, including crews from Mexico, Australia, and across Canada. The question is, what have we learned from past emergencies and what, what can we do with that learning? How have we changed? As the member from North Coast mentioned earlier, I think first and foremost in that list is to recognize the ma massive costs of inaction on greenhouse gas emissions. Taking bold action to reduce emissions will be cheaper than the reactive costs of the increased extreme weather events that, we have, that have been predicted by the science again and again and again if we do not take action. The future costs of inaction are far greater than the costs of smart choices today. Another lesson that we've learned in the past, as mentioned by the member from Shushwap, is the role of psychosocial supports, the, the impact on our mental health in disaster recovery in particular. And like so many others, I've been there and I know how vital these supports are. I'm happy to see what the Provincial Health Services Authority has done in terms of their dedication to making sure this is attended to in disaster recovery. As was mentioned by a wise and empathetic recovery manager that I had the privilege to work with, Chris Marsh, emergencies don't really respect jurisdictions. That's certainly true, as we all know, and one of the lessons that I think we've learned at a local government scale, at a regional district scale, or at the provincial scale, is that we need policy to do a good job of breaking down those artificial jurisdictional boundaries when we want to help communities recover in a genuine way. This really speaks to the importance of collaboration and coming together when we work through these emergencies. In the same vein, I'd add that partisanship in politics absolutely needs to be set aside when we're dealing with crises like this. If we want communities at the core of our recovery model, which is another thing we've learned recently in the importance of uh, disaster management in BC, we need to avoid using communities as political fodder for political posturing. Finally, I would say also that we've learned that our forests mean a whole lot more to us than just their value as timber. For the last two decades, and probably longer, we've been managing our forests with fiber volume as the primary Trump all else value, a value that, uh, that, that has led us to put us in a position where we don't have the capacity to respond to fires as effectively as in the past, where we have to have the potential now going forward. We've seen how important fire smarting communities can be. I'm proud that the changes that are tied in with the forest modernization plan include those changes to put values for communities at the core of our decision making around our forests. Finally, because I love it, I have to also mention the Sendai framework. BC was the first Canadian province to adopt this framework back in 2018. This framework essentially uh, advocates for substantial reduction of disaster risk and losses in lives, livelihoods and health in the economic, physical, social, cultural and environmental assets of persons, businesses, communities and countries. At its core, this means a shift from our own disaster, for our own disaster management from a reactive focus to a broader disaster risk reduction lens. So to sum it all up, I think we've learned a lot and I hope we don't stop. Let's continue to review, learn, and make our system of legislation, regulation, and operations better for our people and our forests. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Colonna West, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise today to speak about this uh, very important topic, uh, not only for my riding, but for many around the province. Um, and I want to speak about this critically important motion before us today, one which I sincerely hope every member of this House, house can passionately endorse, and one that affects many of my constituents in my riding of Kelowna West. Anyone who has followed the progression of wildfires in this province knows that last year's devastating wildfire season was one of the worst ever seen. Kelowna West, with numerous infrastructure, homes and businesses uh, that were destroyed or impacted due to the uh, Brenda Creek Fire, Mount Law, and White, Rake, White Rock Lake Fire, which was obviously the most devastating for, devastating for many communities. People had to scramble for safety, and it was an incredibly stressful time for our community. Left displaced and separated from friends or loved ones, these very individuals looked to the government for their support, 
Often, however, that support was delayed and quite frankly inadequate to serve the needs of these people that were evacuated and displaced. Throughout these challenging circumstances, individuals were frustrated by the lack of information they were receiving from their government. The same government that declared or delayed declaring a state of emergency was, uh, was inconsistent in its communications efforts, which caused more confusion than relief and most importantly, left many of the affected individuals to fend for themselves. After an incredibly destructive wildfire season in 2017, two well-established individuals released their provincially mandated review of one of the most devastating wildfire seasons that we'd seen to date. The 148-page report highlighted major communication gaps, poor cooperation with First Nations, and ina inadequate prevention measures. However, this government largely ignored these recommendations, and so perhaps it's no surprise that during this year's wildfire seasons, individuals spoke out about the lack of leadership uh, coordination and communication from our provincial authorities time and time again. It is not enough for this government to acknowledge there is a problem. We need to see them to actually make meaningful steps to bring about change. Since the wildfire report was published, this government has had every opportunity to learn uh, from the events that took place in 2017 and implement the recommendations suggested. Instead, we, only saw, uh, we not only saw major deficiencies in the response to this year's wildfire season, but we continue to see a lack of support during the recovery phase. In the past, the public safety minister spoke of an imminent overhaul and the BC and of BC emergency laws, and yet months later, nothing has translated to the front lines and we continue to wait. As we approach the winter months, and more information is brought to light, it is clear that the situation could have been dealt with more efficiently. This government should have called a state of emergency earlier instead of waiting until public pressure eventually forced it to do that. Countless fires were burning for weeks after the heat dome in June and until July the 20th for this, uh, for this government to realize that the state of emergency was needed. This was, the, <coughs> this was only after the town of Lytton was uh, experienced the terrible tragedy that claimed two lives and destroyed nearly everything in the community. And after the start of the White Rock Fire that eventually affected thousands of people in my community. If this government is unwilling to make the needed changes, how can we ensure moving forward situations like these will be handled sufficiently? How can we guarantee the residents throughout the regions in British Columbia, that their government is willing and able to deal with situations that affect their physical, mental, and emotional levels of health. The key question that has been brought forward by my constituents since that time has been, what is the government doing to engage in the recovery and rebuilding process? So I stand here today and ask, why did it take the government so long and the public safety minister more than two months to send caseworkers into the regional uh, district to help support these people impacted by the White Rock Lake fire, to ensure that the specific needs were affected and heard and dealt with? Today, I know many are participating in Zoom calls every Tuesday to get information about the emergency but I have been to people's homes where their businesses were lost and they need action. They need disaster financial assistance over and above the fact that some of them had insurance. The bottom line is they need certainty in being able to move ahead. The people of Kelowna West deserve answers and an adequate support to get these through these tough times, Mr. Speaker. The support that they have received to date is simply not good enough. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Member. Vernon Monashi, please. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague, from uh, um, a member from Caribou, Chilcotin, uh, for his motion asking this House to recognize the lessons learned from this year's historic wildfire season and implement them to better prepare our response to future wildfires and needed post-wildfire recovery. I appreciate members' advocacy and presenting this motion as my own uh, writing of Vernon Monashi and surrounding communities were also impacted by the White Rock Lake fire. My sincere condolences uh, and thoughts are with the people who lost their properties and houses and tragic loss of two precious lives. 
to this devasta these devastating fires and the hardship people had to go through. Imagine the stress, anxiety, and pain of losing everything instantly and the time it takes to rebuild everything back. I want to reflect and show appreciation for the efforts of everyone in our communities coming together once again. As I have highlighted, Mr. Speaker, previously, our communities came together to help one another by opening their doors, their homes to people who were evacuated. Restaurants were offering free meals and community members would gather to cheer on and show support to our incredible firefighters, equipment operators, Canadian Armed Forces, volunteers and emergency crews every evening. I cannot emphasize enough the importance and responsibility as elected leaders to share correct and factual information with the people during these devastating times. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, there was so much misinformation about the wildfire uh, emergency management BC response to the Monty Lake and White Rock Lake fire was being shared with people. Many people and firefighters have shared their frustration about this as these actions caused confusion and anxiety. These actions can also cause loss of lives and properties. I am sharing this because my staff and I have heard directly from people and firefighters and frontline responders. Also, such conversations can still be seen online. Our total cost of wildfire suppression from April 1 to September 30th was about $565 million. Uh, this does not include future recovery costs. I want to thank Minister of Forest, Land, Natural Resource Operation and Rural Development and Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General for their regular check-ins, calls and support during these difficult times. I want to thank our brave firefighters on the front lines and those who worked behind the scenes. Uh, they have tried their very best to keep us all safe despite facing many challenges caused by hot and dry weather, winds with little to no rain. Our BC NDP government allocated $136 million for direct fire costs in Budget 2021 for the 2021-2022 for the wildfire season, the same as last year's fire, uh, uh, firefighting budget, but $73 million more than uh, was allocated in Budget 2018. I am reassured and hopeful by the work that is being done by the Cabinet Working Group on Wildfire Recovery and our Premier's commitment to work to mitigate these risks all year, all year round. Fire officials are also welcoming this commitment and saying the province is, I quote, trending in the right direction, end quote. The District of Logan Lake, as mentioned by previous speakers, was pioneer of BC Fire Smart program, which helps communities and individuals prepare ahead of time to reduce fire risks. And we can learn from the commu community of Logan Lake. I hope all members of this House will support this motion and will work together to address the emergency and urgency of climate change, as well as the plan to prepare uh, prepare for future natural disasters, whether it's fires, floods, earthquake, and other disasters, as well as to support uh, this uh, recovery and uh, initiatives, whether it includes people's uh, mental health and all these other areas. I appreciate the time to speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Cam Self thompson please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to get up today and speak to the uh, motion uh, that my colleague from Caribou, uh, Chilcotin, has brought forward. I think this is very, very important uh, uh, discussion and, and debate for us to have. Um, frankly, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, conversation should take place within the confines of, 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 of a more formal process, uh, like an all-party committee or a, a, a review or, or you know, some independent analysis and, and, and review of what actually uh, transpired in this most recent fire season, um, with the goal of actually implementing the kinds of changes that are needed. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say thank you to all the firefighters and, and everybody that, that was involved in, in emergency operations centers, all first responders, everyone that, uh, uh, that is involved in recovery efforts and so forth. Uh, I think we, everyone in this house uh, thanks everyone for, for the incredible work that they have done. There is no dispute there. 
uh, I, I think everyone in this house acknowledges the significance and the, se the severity, the, the frequency of, uh, of the fire season or the fires that are taking place uh, 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 with, with greater regularity. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no dispute uh, there. Mr. Speaker, I, I do, however, uh, believe that uh, there is a disconnect uh, that exists within the government with respect to the impacts of these fires on the communities uh, where, they, where, they, uh, where they hit, uh, on the impacts, uh, the impacts on the people in these, uh, in these communities. Um, we, we can talk uh, about mitigation, uh, and that's a, an entirely different uh, a, a, but very important conversation uh, to have. Don't have uh, enough time to get into that today. Um, there's all kinds of, of things we could talk about in terms of how to better manage our forests, uh, forest lands with, uh, with wildfires in mind. Uh, the fire start pro programs like that in Logan Lake, an excellent example of the kinds of investments we need to see on a massive scale uh, to, to better fireproof communities around the province. But Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about uh, response uh, and recovery. Uh, we have got to change how we do what we do in this province when it comes to preparing for, fighting and recovering from wildfires. We have seen in 2017, the wildfires of 2018 and now the wildfires of 2021, just how devastating uh, wildfires are on our communities and our people. We need to take a look at everything. We need to look at, at how we declare states of emergency in this province and uh, the impact that that has, not just on, on operational uh, realities uh, uh, when, when it's declared, but the morale boost that that provides for, for communities that are, that are under siege uh, by, by wildfires. We need to take a long, hard look at the resources that are made available. There is a lack of resources that, that are available to, to fight fires in this province. That was evident crystal clear in this particular uh, season, uh, this particular uh, 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 wildfire months that we just went through. Um, and the government has to take a long, hard look at that. We have to, to listen to the people in these local areas, Mr. Speaker. We have to leverage that local knowledge in a, in a way that, that, that has never been done before. And when I stand up and I, and I say I'm going to, to, to fight for the people in, in Monty Lake and Paxton Valley, it's not to say that I, I, uh, I encourage people to stay behind fire lines, that I encourage people to, to risk their lives, that I encourage people not to follow evacuation orders. But Mr. Speaker, it is to say that, that, that there is a total lack of understanding on the other side as to what, what would motivate someone to actually stay behind. They're motivated to stay behind because the government, uh, the, the, the government resources that were promised to them in Monty Lake, as, ex as an example, or Paxton Valley, didn't arrive. They weren't there. These are the locals that, that, that are, are telling us this. I believe the locals. It's not one person or, or five people or, or ten people. It's in the entire communities. So when you have everything invested in your land, you have everything invested in your, in your, in your equipment and your infrastructure and your animals and your house, your darn right people are going are gonna, to are gonna want to do everything they can to fight it. First and foremost, they're going to welcome the government resources uh, when they arrive and they're going to get out of the way. Or, Mr. Speaker, they're going to stay behind and they're going to fight to protect what, what is theirs if those government resources don't arrive. There is inherent in that lesson a very important uh, a thing we need to learn about how we, we manage these fires uh, moving forward. The allocation of resources, the, the engagement or lack thereof with the private sector, story after story after story of contractors that were not engaged. The BC Wildfire Service and leaked memos actually confirming that, that that's the case. There weren't enough resources. So Mr. Speaker, it's time for the government to listen. It's time for the government to engage. And it's a time for the government to make serious changes to better protect people and communities in, in the years ahead with respect to wildfires. Thank you, Member. Member for Langley, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the Member for Caribou to Colton for bringing, uh, for bringing this motion for debate and for encouraging us to learn lessons. But I, before I you know, speak to the motion, I just want to say a few words about what we've heard in this debate and what we heard at the beginning of this debate. And, you know, I just want to reiterate <clears throat> the lesson the government needs to learn here, that all governments need to learn in a situation of emergency in danger like this is to get out of the way and to support the experts 
that are working to coordinate and deliver the response. The wrong thing to do here, the absolute wrong thing to do here, is to politicize the wildfire response in the same way that it would be the wrong thing to do in terms of our pandemic response and politicizing or criticizing Dr. Bonnie Henry or the team. We need to make sure that we are acting on their advice and that we are supporting them. And I understand how hard that can be on the ground and how hard when everything is tied up in your property, how hard that can be. But any government, any democratic, modern government has to prize life over property. And that can be incredibly difficult. And there's room to be critical. But the criticism needs to happen after. After folks are out of harm's way and after the danger has ended. And I just want to commend my friend, uh, the member for Surrey Cloverdale, who spent an entire career as a professional firefighter and knows about fire management probably better than anyone in this house. So I want to thank him for his wise words earlier. But it, it's easy, and I think it's easy in this House, Mr. Speaker, and I'm probably as guilty of it as anyone, at, of, to throw spears. The adversarial nature of this House and of these proceedings lend themselves to that. But politicizing emergency management responses, you know, and, and encouraging, uh, you know, it, it, being anything other than absolutely clear about a response to imminent danger is, uh, is not somewhere that we ought to go in this House. Now, it's been said by uh, many members here from both sides, more, eloquent, more eloquently than me, how tragic and historic this fire season has been, and it, not the least of which occurring in a pandemic when folks' minds and energy uh, and mental health has all been focused somewhere else for the past two years, but this fire season has been a wake-up call. It has been a wake-up call in terms of the management of our forest inv inventory, which we heard about from the member from Boundary Similkameen, but also in terms of how we address climate change and the root systemic causes of these fires. We need to get real, and I'm, you know, I'm glad to see the government acting on Clean BC and acting towards addressing carbon emissions to reduce that. Uh, but we also need to get serious about the fact that 60% of fires, of wildfires, are human caused. They're human caused, Mr. Speaker, 60%. You know, and you know, I say this uh, to some of my buddies, my friends that smoke, but the world is not your ashtray. Members of the public ought not to be throwing cigarette butts out of the window. If you're ATVing on a long weekend, you ought not to be doing that by dry grass. We need to make sure that we're taking uh, you know, taking precautions and that we're also addressing the situation. And we need to adapt to the reality. We need to focus on prevention, uh, you know, which was outlined by my friend, the member for North Coast. And we also need to focus on mitigating climate change risk and ensuring that supports to fight uh, and mitigate the impact of wildfires are there, which is what we're doing, in addition to preventing them. And, you know, I actually, uh, this summer, my, uh, my brother, Jamie Mercier, is a natural resource officer um, in the Enforcement and Compliance Branch of the Forest Lands and Natural Resources uh, Ministry. And I had a great conversation with him, uh, or several great conversations throughout the fire, when he was on a team's deployment uh, managing logistics and procurement um, at Castlegard, the Kootenai Central, uh, Central Fire Center. And it really, in those conversations, struck me how complex the coordination of those contracts is and how complex delivering services is. And we need to be mindful of the complexity of that and the need for central management of it, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, in closing, I'll just say it's easy to throw spears, but we need to be mindful of the situation on the ground and we need to make sure that human life and protecting human life is put at the forefront above and beyond all else, even if that means property. Uh, that's just a basic, uh, a basic principle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Fraser Nicola, please. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I rise in the House today to speak on the private member's motion on wildfires. As MLAs, we all have a duty, a duty to serve as voices for those we've been entrusted to represent, to bring their questions, 
their concerns and their frustrations before this House. And how dare you suggest that we are politicizing because we are doing our duty. Here in Victoria on an autumn morning, the unimaginable devastation from this summer's record wildfire season seems like a distant memory and a disconnected memory to many people across the aisle, it seems to me. But there are tens of thousands of British Columbians who are still dealing with the anger and the loss that these wildfires brought to our communities. As the MLA for Fraser Nicola, I stand in this house today as the voice of hundreds of residents in my riding that called Lytton home. The displaced, the lost, the hurt, those who feel completely abandoned and ignored by this government. 117 days 117 days after hundreds of my constituents faced an unrelenting heat wave and were forced to face it alone with little support or warning of the dangers from your government. Because after all, fatalities the chair, were member. just a part of life. Through, through the chair. Then came the culmination of the heat wave in the most horrific and destructive form, a fire that swept through the valley giving our people only minutes to flee for their lives with nothing more on their backs than their clothes, abandoning their homes, their livelihoods, the foundations and memories of their lives they had built in their small community. To the horror of the world, two people perished. And this devastating day was only the beginning for the people of Lytton, as they joined more than 30,000 British Columbians displaced by the wildfires that raged across our province. These residents are still displaced to this day, left with little more than promises from this government that help is on the way and that work is being done on the ground but there has been little evidence to prove that, and so many questions remain unanswered. Where is the promised interim housing? For nearly four months, the people of Lytton have been living in spare bedrooms of friends and family, on couches and in motels, some of them with little more than a suitcase and donated clothes. They have no clue when they'll be able to return to their homes or have a permanent roof over their heads. Shame on us if we can't deal with this. What actions is government taking to rebuild and restore the village of Lytton? Lytton was more than just homes. It was an infrastructure and commerce hub for more than 2,500 constituents in the region who relied on the resources and services offered in Lytton. Residents lost more than their homes. They lost their land, they lost their places of employment, their hospital and critical emergency services. Numerous letters, countless emails, and multiple questions have been raised in this house for weeks on end. And still, this government leaves the people of Lytton in the dark. Government must change its approach. It must work closer with the people most affected, particularly those in the community of Lytton. They expect a clear plan and a timeline for interim housing. They expect that their government will show British, Columbian, British Columbians that their government will be there in their darkest hour. And what they don't expect is members of this House to suggest that the people of Lytton deserve anything less. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Noting the hour. <clears throat> Noting the hour, member. Oh. Noting the hour? I am noting the hour, Mr. Speaker. This moved adjournment of the debate. I move adjournment of debate.
Members, you heard the motion. All in favor, indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose, motion carried. Acting government house leader. What's my motion? Adjournment of uh, the house. I move, I move that the House should now adjourn. Sorry, right. Members, the motion is to adjourn the House. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. This House stands adjourned until 1.30 p.m. today. <laughs>